I want to just share with you uh, a little bit more information after these interviews about continuing in this grow cycle. So your sermon note stuff is probably just going to be shorter uh, these weeks of July. Uh, I'm just going to do some little snippets with you. Uh, so for the re remainder of our service, and Miranda, I'm going to ask you because I don't have my clicker with me to stay with me, and I'll let you uh, advance the slides. Uh, so this one sermon that we're going to go over probably for the rest of July, for the next four Sundays, including today, is just called God Wants Us to Grow. Did, did you know that God wants you to grow? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, wife and kid. Uh, God wants you to grow. By that I mean God wants us to change from who we once were. Okay? We, we sing songs like, Come As You Are, one of my favorites, Dave Crowder. Come as you are, or just as I am, maybe an old hymn, uh, that we can come just the way we are. Jesus accepts us. Uh, not too long ago, I had a person talk to me after a, a service one Sunday, and they said, uh, you know, things at Pasco and Nazareth are changing, and they weren't talking in a good way. Uh, what they were saying to me, as they pulled me aside, they said, uh, things are changing at Pasco and Nazareth. And I don't know if you noticed that or not. See, we used to be a church that just accepted people just the way they are. But you're coming in here and the way you're preaching, it sounds like you don't like the way we are and you want us to change. And I said, amen. <laughs> because God wants us to change. He will accept us just the way we are. But he then says, the old is gone. The new has come. Put away the old self. Get rid of it. And get into the, the new self. So we sing songs like, the, or we read scriptures like, the old has gone, the new has come. Or lay aside your old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And that you may be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. That's Ephesians 4, 22, uh, right around there. God wants us to grow he wants us to be transformed into the image of his son. He wants us to be new and different. Uh, one thing I think all parents love and cherish about our kids is their strong desire to grow up. Right, parents? We love this, don't we? They're 12 going on 27. <laughs> they want responsibility, but they don't want responsibility. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. They just want to grow up. They want to be adults. They want to act like adults. They want to talk like adults. They want to be an adult. And we were that way too. Many of us. Okay, That means all of us. Uh, maybe your parent at one point had a growth chart somewhere on a wall or a closet door where they measured your height every birthday or holiday. Uh, we have when we moved into our new house. We, you know, it's amazing. All the walls are painted and everything. We opened up the closet door and there is a growth chart on the closet door, and it's got like eight people on it. And you know, dad, he just stayed the same height the whole time. And the kids, as they grew up, you know, and everything, and we, we actually called the people that we bought the house from and said, do you want this door? I mean, that's a lot of history. We'll, we'll give you the door. And he said, no, just go ahead and paint over it. I haven't painted over it yet. They're not my kids. But maybe you had something like that where a parent kept track of it, uh, always trying to catch up with mom or dad. You know, my kids, they're always uh, standing next to Tunisia in order to find out if they're taller than her yet. And they're getting close. Michaela's like, you know, right like there. And she loves to say, am I there yet? You know, no, you weren't there yesterday. You're probably not there today. Okay? But it's a challenge. It's a race. They just want to grow up. Okay? Most of us move from not quite making the height requirement at Disneyland or at the fair, whenever you, you stand up next to the sign and the kid going like this and you're still down here and you're, oh, man, I'm still not big enough to ride the ride. But then you go to, from that to uh, waiting until you're 16 and you get a driver's license. You know, my, my daughter's telling me in two and a half years, I can start driving. <laughs> and I say, no, in two and a half years, you'll have the ability to start driving. You may not be driving, but you, you could, okay? And then when we're 16 and we get the driver's license, we get some freedom. Boy, now we're just anticipating being 21, out on our own, having our own place, got the job, and all those things. And then before you know it, you got kids of your own, and they're trying to catch up with you. They're trying to grow up. Most everyone wants to grow up, 
and progress. I look at Marky because Marky thinks that adult is a bad word. <laughs> yeah. And, and there are some of us, I don't want to grow up, I'm a Toys R Us kid, you know. But, but really, in a lot of things, we do. We want to grow up. We want to be in charge. We want to progress. Uh, have you ever thought about what spiritual growth looks like, and, and could you even measure it by how often you go to church, or by how many ministries you're involved with, how many years you've been serving on the board, or, or by how much you give to the church? I'm a great Christian because I'm, I'm like the number one tither. Like you secretly in your head, you keep track of what you think everybody gives and you say, I'm number one, you know? If you think that you're that way and that's, and that's your growth, but these things are not at the heart of spiritual growth, of how God wants to grow us. At the heart of spiritual growth is learning how God wants us to live so that as his kids... We can please him by living that way. Okay? In Colossians chapter 1, I, I would summarize, all of Colossians is really Paul talking about spiritual growth to this group of people in Colossae. And I would summarize Colossians chapter 1 with, with a saying like this about what spiritual growth looks like. Uh, I think Paul would, would say spiritual growth means growing to know how God wants us to live so that we seek to please him in all things. Okay? Spiritual growth means growing to know how God wants us to live so that we seek to please him in all things. Your kids, if I use this analogy about being parents and the kids, kids want to grow up, we can see our kids grow up because they start doing things differently. They learn empathy and sympathy. They learn uh, how to give you gifts. Okay, You come home from work. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I come home from work and my kids will say, Dad, I helped mom make your favorite cookie, Snickerdoodles. That was an advertisement. Did you feel like making cookies? There were Snickerdoodles this morning that Pat brought. I had four of them. Before any of you got here, because they're my favorite cookie. Okay? But so like my kids would say, Dad, Mom and I all day, we bake these cookies. We know these are your favorite cookies. We bake them because they're your favorite cookies. And they want, to, they want the accolade. They want to please you, you know. Or if you just had a bad day at work or you're sick or whatever. My daughter has drawn me. She's just an incredible artist. She has given me and drawn me so many cards. Colored me so many pictures and everything. I know you're not feeling well, Dad, but I wanted you to have this. I hope this would cheer you up. That's part of the growing up. Our kids grow up because they want to please us. And we start seeing those things. We start seeing that depth of relationship with our kids. So we would say spiritual growth with Dad, Abba, with the Father, God, means growing to know how he wants us to live so that we seek to please him in all things. So I want to dig into these verses. If you got your device or you got your Bible with you, I want you to open up to Colossians chapter 1. Okay, Colossians chapter 1 is in the New Testament. Okay, it's a letter that Paul wrote. Colossians chapter 1, we're just going to be going over a few verses over the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to be starting with ch uh, chapter 1 verse 9 today, 9 and 10. So I would say this, spiritual growth means growing to know how God wants us to live. So we just break down that statement that we first had about a summary that I believe Paul would have us say about the whole chapter. And, and we say this is our first point. Spiritual growth means growing to know how God wants us to live. So Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 starts with this. It says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. This is Paul praying. It's part of his letter, an opening prayer for the kids in Colossae. So let's pray about this, this verse. God, we, we just lift this up to you. We say, would you teach us about spiritual growth, about your wisdom and understanding as we dig into this verse today, would you reveal truth to us by the power of your Holy Spirit and bless us so that as we leave here, we are transformed by your word and we seek to do your will and to please you. We praise this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul's prayer 
that the Colossians would be filled with the knowledge of God's will doesn't mean that he wants them to know whether they should take a different job offer or not, or to marry a particular person, or to watch a show on TV versus a game on TV. He, he's asking that they might know God's moral will revealed in his word, that, that they would know God's heart revealed through his word. Uh, being filled with this knowledge is a prayer that they would be shaped by this knowledge so that it would be uh, that it would govern every thought that they have, how they talk, how they act, every deed they do. And since God's moral will is a reflection of his holy character, Paul, his prayer is that these new believers would grow to know who God is himself to the depth of his heart as he has revealed himself in the Old Testament scriptures and now the New Testament scriptures. He, he's doing this because at the time in Colossae, there's some false teaching going on. And it had infiltrated the Christian church. And it, it may have been emphasizing how these false teachers would bring them the fullness of knowledge that they, they needed to know. Okay? It, it, it may have been that the pastor, the preacher, the person up front could infiltrate and say, I will give you all the answers you need to know. Does this sound familiar? This happens even in the church today. It's very dangerous for any pastor or person to get up and speak for God and tell you they have the answers for you, all the information that you need to know. These false teachings would bring them fullness of knowledge to counter this claim. Paul just says to them, uh, the theme of fullness is in Christ himself, in God. Okay, And to do this, I love this, Paul uses absolutes. Now you know how I am about absolutes. When people say, every time, no. You never, no. You always, no, you know, these are words we should not use with each other because they're just so concrete. But whenever God uses them in his word, we ought to pay attention. Okay, so as we look through this verse, uh, verse 9 in chapter 1, and then further on, we're going to uncover as we go. There are repeated absolute words, all, every. All these. So in chapter 9, it says all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We I underline that. All wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives uh, to please Him in every way. It goes on to say in verse 10, in every way. Uh, again in verse 10, bearing fruit in every good work. Uh, in uh, verse 11, strengthened with all power. Not just some power, all power. Paul is teaching them that he wants them to know, he wants us to know that every spiritual need that we have is to be found fully in Jesus Christ and in Jesus alone. So why go anywhere else? Why listen to anyone else? Paul kicks off these absolutes with the end of the, uh, verse 9 when he says we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. It's probably the sixth or seventh time I've said it in just a few minutes, but I want you to hear that, that verse. So as we look at it, we can find out a couple things. First is the knowledge of how God wants us to live requires spiritual wisdom. Okay? We need to be able to be wise about things of the Spirit. It requires spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom and understanding come from God's Spirit and stand in contrast to the world's wisdom. The world's wisdom of false teachers and false prophets. Paul wants to counter in his uh, letter to the Colossians church, wisdom is not of the world. Wisdom is something much different. It comes from God. Wisdom is an Old Testament concept. Uh, Solomon, if you remember when we were going through the story and we came to Solomon, we learned that when Solomon, God said, you can have anything, you just ask it and I'll give it to you. And Solomon asked for chokmah. Do you remember that? That fun Jewish word that you get to use glottalness with? Chokmah. Okay. Chokmah isn't just smarts. 
it's a wisdom to know God's heart, so it is smart with a purpose, okay? Not just being wise of the world, but wise because of what God wants in his own heart, and then being able to act on that wisdom. Hokmah is a special kind of wisdom. So Solomon asks for this hokmah, and he used it well in the first part of his life. So it is God's heart wisdom, acting on God's heart. But another word behind the Hebrew concept of hokmah or wisdom is skill. So another definition behind the word hokmah is skill. And we would say the men who were able to construct the tabernacle according to God's plan that was revealed to Moses uh, were called wise, uh, meaning otherwise skilled. So God gives Moses this plan to build the tabernacle. Moses then says it to the guys, and the guys construct it exactly the way God wanted it. They were skilled. <coughs> But they were wise. They had wisdom to discern what God wanted, and then they did what God asked. Okay? They didn't say, well, you know, if you painted it this color, then it would set off this. And it, if you put here, jewels here instead of over there, they didn't do any of that. They were wise, and they did it exactly the way God asked. So just as a skilled carpenter can take a piece of rough wood and shape it according to a plan into a beautiful and useful piece of furniture, the wise person, the person who asks God for chokmah, the wise person is able to take the rough elements of life, the rough elements of this world, and shape them according to God's plan into something beautiful and useful to God. We can take all the stuff of our world and we can point it to God's glory. We can be wise with it. We need to have spiritual wisdom in order to know how to live and grow spiritually. So spiritual wisdom requires learning about God and how he wants us to live so that our lives will not be ruined by sin or ruined by this world or off course, the plans altered, but rather we become a finely crafted image of Jesus, drawing everyone to God and his glory. I often pray here in our, in our prayer time, our closing prayers, that God would make us into the image of his son Jesus more and more every day. So that when people see us, they don't see us, they see Jesus. So when people see us, they don't see a stereotypical uh, Christian, quote unquote, they see the image of the son of God. Done the right way. Done God's way, not our way, but God's way. So spiritual wisdom requires learning about God and how he wants us to live so that our lives will not be uh, gone down that path that misrepresents who God is, but so that we can be close as possible to the image of his son Jesus so God can receive the glory that is due him. The second part of this is the knowledge of God wants us uh, to live requires spiritual understanding. And wisdom and understanding are, are somewhat synonymous. People would say, isn't that the same thing? Being smart, you understand things. They are, but there are maybe subtle differences between wisdom and understanding. Wisdom get, lets us know how God's heart desires us to live, but understanding is the ability to discern between the things of this world and the things of God. In other words, understanding <coughs> enables us to put the pieces of wisdom together in specific situations. We can discern the difference between what God is asking us to do and what the world is asking us to do. And we can apply it to the situation that we're in. Understanding. Not just the, the heart part or head part of having the wisdom to know the difference, but then how to apply it in life. How to walk as a Christian in a world that does not want to see Christians walking. Okay? How do we, uh, out of love, represent who God is, a holy and righteous God that is separate from this culture and this world? How do we do it while we're here in this world? More and more modern theologians and pastors are observing something in, in the culture in the church in America, and it is this. 
The knowledge of God is declining. I said at the beginning of our journey through the story, biblical illiteracy is on the rise okay, within the church. We are not doing a great job of keeping our generations informed and understanding about the Word of God. Okay? So the knowledge of God is declining in the church about who He is and how He wants us to live, okay? about His Word, just, just knowing it, being able to understand it and being able to quote it if there's some uh, moment that you needed to recall Scripture. The knowledge of God is declining, but at the same time, our fascination with techniques and fads within the church is growing at an exponential rate. And so we would say uh, churches can, can get focused on how better to convey the gospel of, of Jesus, the good news about God, and forget the good news about God. Okay? We can make our church services look like concerts. We sing songs that nobody knows. You know, I've been to a couple churches where their band, men have an incredible band, and they write all their own music. The problem is nobody knows their songs. And when they sing it that Sunday, everybody kind of stands there and watches a band worship. And, and they miss out on the worship. We, we can say, well, if we're going to be an excellent church in Pasco, it is Washington. Starbucks was founded here. We need a coffee bar in our church. We need an espresso stand. Okay? In order to connect with people in the culture, we need a barista making coffee for us, okay? And we'll make it a non-profit thing. We won't charge a lot of money. You know, instead of people going to Starbucks or Dutch Brothers or Roasters on their way to church, they can come here and they'll get coffee for just two bucks or whatever, you know? We just need a little bit to cover the cost of making the coffee. But to be relevant, we need a coffee stand here. Whatever it is, folks, we've spent so much time in the past few decades trying to figure out how to get people in church that the knowledge of God is declining. And what God would have us do. Okay? And it's not to say that these things are bad. Okay? They're fine. But when they replace, when they replace our knowledge of who God is and how He is interacting with us, when they take precedence over the preaching of God's Word, these things are not good. Not good at all. The knowledge of God is declining. Our fascination with techniques and fads and how to have a better church, quote unquote, or a better Christian life is increasing. I get uh, emails and postcards all the time. <coughs> offers to attend conferences or buy books on uh, how to have a better church. Because I'm a pastor. It's like people, whenever I, when I got ordained and I got the reverend name in front of my name as a title, all of a sudden I was open to a whole new world of junk mail. <laughs> well, if you're a reverend, then you need to know how to have a better church. And we've got a conference that will tell you the seven best ways to increase your church growth. Okay, get a coffee bar. Train, train by a professional barista with cups that have your church's logo on it. You know, whatever it may be. I get those, and I get offers to go to conferences, or why your church is dying, and here's how you can fix it, and all these things. But the techniques and the fads come from the world, and not from God's Word most of the time. Self-help books reign supreme in our world. If you go to Barnes & Noble, any bookstore, one of the biggest section of books is self-help books. Okay? We sell them by the droves, billions of dollars. It's self-help on anything. You know, mechanics for dummies. You can learn how to fix your car, change your blinker fluid. Okay? <laughs> um, fishing for dummies. How to tell the best fishing story, you know, where your fish was bigger than it actually was. Whatever. Self-help books reign supreme and in the bookstore. Even the Christian bookstore, where so many authors and pastors give you the ideas on however many ways to become a better you in Christ. The problem is that book's already been written, folks. It's called the Bible. Okay? Everything you need to know to be a better you in Christ is right here in this book. Okay? Nobody's got to write another book about it. It's already been written. We just need to read it. Okay? And then we need to start applying it in our life. We need to start growing. Uh, how do you become filled or controlled or shaped by the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom 
and understanding. And I have two things. I'm just going to wrap this up with these two things. So how do you, how do you uh, get spiritual growth started? How do you strike the match and get it going in your life? And the first one is this. Uh, read and meditate on the Word of God. And everybody's like, oh, I want to read the Bible. Okay? Last year we went through a whole read the Bible in a year. My first year here, 2017. We, we read scripture every day. I put it on Facebook. Uh, some of you read scripture every day. Uh, and put it on Facebook. We went through it. And it would be awesome if every single one of us would dedicate ourselves to reading God's Word completely every year. The more we read it, the more we know the more we know, the more we can do. The more we know, the less misinformed we are when challenges about culture and things come in and we say, well, we're supposed to love everybody, but we're supposed to do this as well. Um, when you get all the challenges in, in social media and on the news about speaking, people speaking about what they think God thinks, and you can say, no, I, I know I read in his word that that's not right. You, you can know, you can discern, you can understand when you're hearing something that isn't biblical that people are saying is biblical. Okay? There's so many ways that reading scripture transforms your life. Reading the Bible over and over, thinking about it, about what it says, and asking God for understanding, we better recognize the dangers of this world and we can avoid smashing into them. God's word exposes dangerous ideas, dangerous doctrines, things that just don't match up with scripture, okay? It also reveals the way that Satan has tempted people in the past and the consequences when they have yielded to Satan's schemes and given up on being obedient to God. We sort of see lots of it. We read through it in the story. Consequences, hard consequences, destruction, Annihilation, okay? Being put into bondage and slavery for years upon years. There's a reason reading the Word of God transforms us. Every word that every Christian or preacher says is not necessarily good. I realize I'm opening myself up at that because I'm a preacher, okay? You need to know that when I stand up here and say stuff about Scripture, I want you to know firsthand from God's word whether what I'm saying is right or not. I don't want you to blindly believe everything I say and say because he's the pastor and he's probably read scripture more than me and done more scripture studies and gone to school for it and everything. He knows better. No. I want you to know the word so that if by chance I misspeak, because it happens a lot. Sometimes my mouth gets in front of me, right? I don't know if any of you ever have that problem. Probably not. None of you have ever spoken anything and then gone back and go, why did I even say that? Okay. Words come out in a different order and that changes the meaning, whatever. I count on you as being an accountability, as me being a, a leader of the church, you holding me accountable to how I'm leading and what I'm preaching. It better be what we believe as the Church of the Nazarene. And you need to know what that means. Okay? So reading and meditating on the word. Every word that every preacher says, and every Christian, every word that they say, is not necessarily good. They could be misleading if we do not know what God says. God imparts spiritual wisdom and understanding. If you listen to K-Love Radio, everything that K-Love says and the DJs say on K-Love isn't necessarily Christian. It's not even necessarily biblical. It may sound good, but it may not be what God wants us to know. Yes, it's a Christian radio station run by humans. Okay, Not every song on the radio that we, re that we listen to uh, on K-Love or Air One, Christian, any Christian radio, the message if you're on uh, satellite radio, not every song agrees with the doctrine that the Nazarenes believe. That's okay. Because there's lots of things that we believe that don't get us to heaven and have nothing to do with us getting to heaven. And that's what we focus on on essentials. But there's stuff that we listen to and we sing that we, maybe that's not how we believe scripture. We have to look at scripture and see if that's right, you know, how we look at it. In order to know all these things, folks, you've got to be well versed in God's word, his heart. So number one, read and meditate, pray upon God's word. Read more. The last one is this. 
Um, I have been helped probably the most by having a spiritual mentor, having someone who is more spiritually mature than myself to bounce things off of. Hey, I've been thinking about God's Word. I've been reading it. I've been praying about it. And what do you think about my take on this? Now, my spiritual mentor is my mentor from the denomination. He is an older pastor in our denomination. And he can tell me what our denomination believes. He can tell me what other denominations believes. I trust him because he has a massive amount of knowledge on God's Word. And he can differentiate all of them. And I use him to teach me. Someone who's been in the Word longer. Someone who has more experience. Now, just because they've been Christian longer doesn't mean that they're your spiritual mentor. Okay? You can have somebody that's been in the church for 40 years and can't tell you the books of the Old Testament or whether the book you're reading out of is from the Old Testament or the New Testament. They may have just skated by in the church and are great people, tithing, praying, doing all those sorts of things. But you need someone speaking into your life that has knowledge that God can use. A discipleship partner that will disciple you and shape you. An accountability partner, as, as CJ was talking about, who can call you on things when you say, hey, I'm, I'm in the Word, I'm reading these things, and then they catch you a week later doing things that you just read about that you're not supposed to do. You know, Someone to be there and mentor you and shape you. Having a spiritual mentor helps all of us remember that we don't grow alone. We don't, folks. We do not grow alone. We must remain connected to a church. We must remain connected to a body of believers. We must remain connected to someone who has more understanding, someone who has more knowledge okay, to impart into us, to give us. We must stay connected to Jesus. We can't grow in this world if we are not connected to the vine, okay, to the true source of everything, and that's Jesus. I love John chapter 15 because it's another one of those, it's the I am the vine who are the branches passage. And it's another one of those where Jesus says the same thing over and over again because it's like scripture for dummies. Okay? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you'll bear fruit. If you don't remain in me, you won't bear good fruit. If you remain in me, he says 11 times in 7 verses, remain, abide, stay, okay, whatever translation you read, he says it over and over and over again so that we will get it. You have to stay connected to God in order to grow, okay? So I just want to read this, uh, verse 1 through 4, John chapter 15, 1 through 4. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. The part that gets me is that you and I are the branches. We're not the vine, okay? And branches, as many of us would assume... The branches don't produce the fruit. I hope you understand. The vine produces the fruit on the branch. Okay? The plant, the heart of the plant, produces the fruit. We are a conduit. We're a branch, but we're a conduit that God's fruit can be produced on or not. Okay? If you clip us off the vine, we don't bear any fruit. You can't bear any fruit by yourself. The fruit does not come from the branch. It comes from the vine. <coughs> If only we stay connected to the vine, will we bear fruit. But, I love the part where it says, God prunes the branches that bear fruit. He cuts off parts of that branch so it will grow more. It will produce more. Now, most of you are like, yeah, I get the whole stay connected to the vine thing, and I want to bear fruit. But I don't like the pruning part. Anybody like the pruning part? Where God, you know, pulls an arm and goes, Shh. okay? Something that you're really interested and into, and God says, that's not a fruitful part. I'm going to cut that. I'm going to just get it out of there so you can be more fruitful. This is growth, folks. Spiritual growth. It's growth in our body, emotional growth, physiological growth. Okay, when we get rid of the, of the bad stuff in our life, we live better. 
we're healthier, okay? And when we get rid of the, the old stuff that God says, that's gone now, here's the new, when we allow him to prune the old stuff out of our life, to cut it out, we become more. We become better. We produce way better fruit. We produce way better life. Staying connected to the vine and allowing God to prune us. It costs us something to turn away and give up the things of the old self, the old life, and to put on new life. But God prunes us so that we may grow. So here's a thought for you today. If you feel like your spiritual life is stagnant, that you're not growing, may I ask, if you're daily in the Word, reading and meditating on God's Word, <coughs> and if you say, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a pretty good job of reading, reading God's Word, then I would go to, do you have a spiritual mentor, someone teaching you, someone discipling you? Because going it alone is really hard. I can't understand everything about Scripture and how it's written. I need someone who's learned to teach me so then I can teach somebody else. Okay? So do you have a spiritual mentor? If not, get one. That may be your stagnant area. Okay? The third one is probably the most readily recognized within the church, though. You may be connected to the vine, and you may be have, a, have, have a spiritual mentor, okay? But if you're not allowing God to prune you, to recognize the parts of your life that he just doesn't need anymore and that you don't need anymore, and allow him to cut it off, this may be your stagnant part of your life. You're holding on to dead things, and it's keeping you from blossoming the way God wants you to blossom. So my challenge for you is this. Get in the Word. If you're not regularly in the Word, if you want to grow, get in the Word to increase your spiritual wisdom and your spiritual understanding. Number two, find a spiritual mentor to help you stay on track with your growth. Someone who has the knowledge and can speak into your life and hold you accountable. And number three, probably the hardest one because none, none of us like having appendages cut off, allow God to prune you to take the things of your life that are not fruitful and to cut them off and cast them in the fire and let them be destroyed. Move from the old life, put it aside, to the new life. Amen? Amen.